Okay, this is chapter 22, Facilitating Hygiene. Again, a reminder, I don't own this material under fair use. I'm providing lecture content for my nursing students only using this material. All content within is for educational purposes and does not provide medical advice. So, question, what is hygiene? Hmm. Different thoughts, different concepts, but typically in nursing, what we're talking about is activities involved in personal grooming and cleanliness. So that comes from ADLs, activities of daily living, bathing, showering, and combing your hair. So maintenance of personal hygiene, it promotes comfort, improves your self-image, and decreases infection and disease. The nursing role is to assess self-care abilities. Are they able to provide for themselves or do they need assistance in providing for their ADLs and promoting self-care in, in ADLs? So always the most highest level that they can do. If they can take care of themselves, do it. If not, provide assistance. Um, delegating appropriate parts of hygiene care. It's not your responsibility to do every single person's bath. If you have a team of an LPN and a CNA, that is also um, the role of delegating the appropriate parts of hygiene care. Personal preference. Um, there's a lot of personal preferences, when to bathe, what products to use. There's different beliefs in hygiene and cleanliness amongst different religions and spirituality. So there's a lot of um, people who might not think that you bathe before bed or that you shouldn't go to bed with wet hair. Okay, So always ask the person, what products do you want to use? What time do you like usually bathe? Do you bathe first thing in the morning, last thing at night? What is the routine? Um, there are plenty of moms right after birth that do not want to take a shower. They want to go ahead and um, have warm tea, warm chicken soup, things like that. And that it's actually against um, the thought process to have a cold shower um, right after giving birth, that they should provide a warm, warm fluids, warm warmness right after. So everybody has different thoughts about that. The economic status, obviously, if they're homeless, they might not have the availability to warm water, warm showers. There should, could be monetary restraints, so only having enough money to keep the heat on or keep the electricity on, that might be one of the first things that goes. The developmental level, so it depends what your parents, what the media, what the peers, what the age level. Obviously, a baby, you're going to have to do that bath yourself. Um, a teenager should be able to do that themselves. Right. So lots of things come in, lots of factors influence hygiene and self-care practices as well as knowledge level. So one of the basic things that we teach little boys, little girls is front to back wiping with a little girl. That's important to maintain good hygiene and not get a UTI. There are some physical factors that might influence hygiene and self-care practices. So physical factors, health status, pain, limiting your mobility or energy, Limited mobility would decrease your range of motion, weak, weaken you, and might be on bed rest so you can't get to the shower. Sensory deficits, decreased independence, increased safety concerns. Would we want someone in a shower if they are um, at risk of harming themselves? Okay, probably not going to go along. All right. Some cognitive impairments, if they can't determine the need for hygiene, if they can't smell anymore, um, if they can't problem solve ADL processes, if they forget when the last time they did have a bath, 
um, emotional disturbances, there's a profound lack of energy in emotional disturbances, altered reality. Okay. So just some thought processes of factors that would impair hygiene in a patient. Which factor would be most likely to influence the hygiene practices of a client who is homeless? The degree of mental illness, his cultural beliefs, the living environment, or the knowledge level. So if you think about being homeless, what is the living environment that they are in and what do they have access to? So a patient that's homeless might not have any access to facilities to be able to perform routine hygiene measures. So your assessment about self-care, typically you can um, do an assessment from the doorway. As you walk into the room, you will be able to see how cleanly they are, how um, if there is an odor coming off, you would be able to smell that. So that's part of your assessment when you walk in the room, looking at their self-care. Do they look kept in clean clothes and do they look disheveled? Okay, so that's kind of the thought process that we have walking into the room. So analysis, planning, planning interventions and implementation. So schedule hygiene care, routine hygiene care in an inpatient facility, um, hourly rounds to make sure that they peed, pooped, taken care of. Seeing every patient every hour on schedule to offer with health care needs, self care needs. Upon wakening, you give them a washcloth, have their wash their face and hands, do mouth care. Then after breakfast, we can do bathing, toileting, hair, skin, and bed making. That's our routine care that we provide. And then again at night, you can offer them toileting, hand washing, oral care, and getting ready for any visitors. And then when the visitors are gone, prior to sleep, trying to do some relaxation activities and readying their environment for sleep. So turning off the lights or turning down the lights, turning off TVs, turning off the lights in the hallway. Some relaxation activities might mean um, some lavender, so that's also a question for them if they would like some lavender. Delegating hygiene care um, prior to delegating, always make sure you assess if they can do their own care. And then you can instruct your UAP on the client's limitations, the amount of assistance they're going to need to give them, any use of assisted devices that they use, the presence and care of any tubes, and observations to make during hygiene care. The care of this skin, knowing the anatomy and physiology and the main functions of skin, factors that affect skin are the health status and the developmental level. So think about the skin care of a dehydrated patient versus a overhydrated patient. You might want to put extra lotion on that patient if they're really dry. Knowing the main functions of the skin, we would want to keep skin closed. So if there's skin pairs, taking care of those skin pairs right away. <coughs> Running infection. In your assessment, there's subjective and objective information that you're getting. You're planning your day. If there's wounds and things. The purpose of bathing, remember, health promotion, social interaction, and pleasure or relaxation. So depending on when they want to bathe, that might be a, a way that they relax and get calmed down for night. Or it could be one of those things that they need social interaction. That's one of the biggest times that we can talk with a patient and really get to see their skin. So if there's an assist bath, you bathe reaching hard to reach areas. If it's a complete bath, it's usually a complete bath. 
A partial bath, you bathe only those areas absolutely necessary, including the perineum. So a partial bath, they do as much as they can and then you help them. Some other type of baths, um, you could have a towel bath, a packaged bath, that's for someone going to surgery. You might actually have a packaged bath that needs to be done prior to surgery. A shower, a bath in the tub, or a therapeutic bath. Different things that we use. Um, special considerations if someone has dementia or if someone's obese. That might really um, come into play. Um, dementia, just being careful with that and always having two people. Um, he said, she said, not understanding what's going on, the potential for drowning, especially if you're putting them in a tub. And um, a patient that's obese being very careful about um, mentioning and motionings, um, make sure that they have the appropriate safety um, situation taken care of there. You don't want someone to slip and fall, especially in the bathroom. Um, showers especially, a lot of falls happen right outside the shower because we haven't put down um, enough towels to absorb the water when they get out of the shower. The confused client becomes distressed and agitated when the UAP attempts to give the morning bath. The, the nurse instructs the UAP to so if somebody's um, confused and distressed, agitated, what do you want to do for them? A partial bath, help bath, bed bath, or complete bath. If they're agitated already, right, try to get them to start helping you would be the best thing to get them to thought process of, oh, okay, we're getting a bath now, okay? So that would be a partial bath. The intent of the partial bath is to cleanse only the areas in most need of hygienic care. The nurse would continue to monitor their emotional and cognitive state and alter the type of bath accordingly. You can always wait, take a break and come back in 30 minutes, see if they're less agitated. All right, foot care, again, assessment, analysis, planning outcomes. With foot care, usually that has to do with diabetics especially. Nail care, think about the assessment of the analysis. What are you doing? Okay. So foot care, providing lotion. Again, no lotion between the toes on a diabetic. Nail care, typically we're not clipping nails. Keep your clippers away from people's nails. The thing about nail care, and you'll see it in the ATI, is to go straight across, not around the corners of the nails, because you're more apt to clip skin. Just be really careful with nail care. It's not something we typically do in the hospital. Um, if they need nail care, then it's the um, podiatrist that comes to help us with that. Major areas of oral care. Oral care, hygiene care. Most of the time, this is what you're looking at, and this is what you're thinking about with oral care. If you can, give them a toothbrush. If you can't, then we use sponges. That's for the removal of food particles and secretions. It improves appetite and it reduces the incidence of pneumonia. So the one with the little suction device attached to it, you, suck, you put that to your yonker, to your suction tubing, and it helps get that liquid back out. So that would be especially important with someone who is um, unconscious. You will see the pink sponges quite a bit, especially at end of life, so that the family feels like they're doing something. They can go ahead and wet the mouth, wet the lips. Remember that um, research shows that the honey glycerin swabs actually dry people out more. So we don't typically use lemon swabs anymore because of the drying properties of the lemon glycerin. So while you're in doing oral care, you want to make sure that at least once a shift you're going in and doing oral care on the patient, not just assuming that the UAP knows what they're doing, because you want to do a full assessment of the oral cavity. 
So the condition of the teeth, cavities, gingivitis, get the um, dentures out, get them put in away and clean at least once a day. Um, some conditions that might affect the mouth, stomacitis, glossitis, oral lesions, oral malignancies. It's really important to do a real thorough check. So a lot of the times they find oral cancer by going to the dentist because that's the person who's really looking around in your mouth really good. Um, stomacitis, if you think about that, most of the time those kind of things happen with cancer patients because the chemotherapy causes an irritation of the skin in their mouth. So oral lesions and stuff, they may actually have um, like, uh, what do you call, um, almost like um, a numbing agent to swish and swallow or swish and discard so that um, they can eat. Okay. Um, oral care, constantly assessing, making nursing diagnoses, planning, evaluating, implementing, and then evaluation of those outcomes. So when providing oral care for the unconscious patient, the nurse should place the patient on their side with the head of the bed in a lowered position, skip brushing the teeth as the patient could aspirate, swab the patient's lips and oral cavity with an or a lemon glycerin swab at least hourly, or place the patient in an upright position and brush their teeth with a sponge brush. Which one are you thinking? So it's probably not going to be B and C. So when I put them upright, or when I put them on their side with their head of the bed lowered, which way would I do it for an unconscious patient? So thought process with safety would be on their side which is called the recovery position, because you would not want them to aspirate. So if you put them head up in their bed, that's great, but they could aspirate stuff that you're putting in their mouth. So to facilitate oral hygiene and protect the patient's airway, the nurse should keep the head lower than their stomach and on their side. Hair care, um, when you're doing hair care, just be very careful with this because we don't know whose hair is dyed. We don't know whose hair is ultra sensitive, right? So you don't want to just go down through the unit doing hair care without asking the patient first. So typically if they're um, gray hair, they might have dyed that hair so it's important to know that you're using the right shampoo. Um, if they have oily hair, they might use a different shampoo. Okay, so really be careful with hair care. Hair is one of those things <laughs> that some people are really picky about. So just ask the patient prior to getting started. Um, analysis, nursing diagnoses, so you're looking at hair care. The worst possible problem with hair care, right, would be dandruff or head lice. So always some test questions out there. With head lice, what would you do? How do you take care of that? How do you plan? How do you intervene? And what do you educate on? Head lice is going to be um, using the NYX shampoo, but then anything that cannot be washed in the house needs to be put in a trash bag for a week out in the um, garage and then laundered if they can okay so just know those special needs for head lice okay so what do you do when you need to persuade a client to have a bath when the client is adamantly against having anyone see their body how would you take care of that patient what would you do? 
So first things assessment, right? Why, why not? What's the problem? I would not force somebody into a bath because you don't know if there's child sexual assault. You don't know the situation. So really assess first, diagnose, intervene. Okay. So if they're adamant about no one seeing their body, is it okay to bring them the washcloths and they can do it themselves? Is it okay with, right? So think about this. If they're adamant about it, it may be something we need to ask more questions. So eyes, assessment, diagnosis, right? Eye care, just think about eyes. You will get this more in the hygiene level uh, ATI. Eyes, inner to outer. Inner is infected, outer is less infected. Inner has that little um, tear duct, which is really important, okay? If you have an eye infection, you wanna go from inner to outer one washcloth per eye or flip it over and use a different part of that washcloth for the other eye. You do not want pink eye going from one eye to the other. Pink eye is extremely infectious and the entire family will have it eventually if you don't be careful. Eyes, what else? Um, eye drops and things like that. We'll go through that when we get to medications as well. Just think about eyes um specifically with eyes vision difficulties ears again we will do more in lab about ears but just think about um earwax and things like that you don't want to be going poking around in their ears don't do that send the right doctor in if they need that most of the time, ears includes eardrops, and you will need to know how to do eardrops. Nose, again, no special care required. Um, they may need to provide care on an uh, unconscious patient or an NG tube in place. We'll get to that when we get into NG tubes. Um, just remember to have um, Kleenexes available and ready and have a way to discard them. So nose, typically no big special care related to that. Some people do sinus irrigation, um, but again, most of the time um, just requires suctioning. The environment, make sure your environment is clean. This is why we go into a room and we start cleaning up. Okay. How many times have you gotten in a room and you see milk from three weeks ago on the shelf? Okay, so clean up the environment, get it clean. Every day, housekeeping should come in and clean the environment, but you should as well. Get stuff in the trash, empty the trash, get a good clean environment. Look at your environment for safety issues. Okay, just good hygiene. Make sure that you have um, plenty of washcloths, towels, and everything they need in the bathroom so that they can provide their own care as needed. Safe, effective care. Oral care is essential. It's goal-directed, client-centered nursing care for older pre-op, post-op patients to prevent complications. Based on your experience caring for this kind of type of client, explain the interventions you can provide. Um, explain interventions that the family can provide in helping you and facilitate post-discharge help. So that's why we're really important to um, model hygiene and also um, show the family what is expected prior to their loved one going home. Why do you think they might work? So based on different kinds of interventions that we can use, why would they work? Why would they not work? Think about money. If they don't have the money for that, it might be very difficult to continue the hygiene. So sometimes we'll give the four by fours to the patient versus telling them to go buy them. So just think about different things to help the patient take care of themselves. All right, that's it with hygiene.